Welcome to Culmination, where we're not experts, but we sure have a lot to say. In the process of becoming our best self, I have with me the statistics teacher, Mr. Ben Tilton, to discuss learning and education. And with that said, let's get started. So, Mr. T, what is learning in your own words? Casey, first, thank you so much for having me on. And of course. That you, you started off seriously with, like, probably one of the bigger questions in life. So I'm not positive that I can, uh, w- within a few seconds, answer what is learning. But I have uh, a few talking points, I guess, that I sort of bring up. First, I, as a teacher, which this is 21 years of teaching for me, ending the 21st and basically the longest year of teaching and learning, Mm-hmm. that we've had in American history, I will say that learning from a teacher perspective, one a- huge aspect of learning, I think, is, and I'll, I'll refer to teenagers because I do teach high school age kids, 15 to 18, 14 to 18. I think a huge part of learning is like self-discovery. And huh. Besides just gaining the knowledge and the skills, I mean, that, that's your dictionary answer to what is learning, gaining the knowledge, gaining, learning a new process, um, being able to synthesize, being able to evaluate all of those skills that you're preached to, that, that you're preached, teachers are preached to about. Yes. Um, I really think learning is like discovering how you best absorb information discovering Mm. as a student how you best um pick up a new skill how you best learn a new process how you best figure out or solve a problem and every single human being is different everybody learns in different ways that's if you could see me i'm air quoting right now learns (laughs) in different ways but i think a huge part of the adolescent learning like the teenage years is discovering what works best for you and as you go through life and you get a problem how do you best solve it me personally one of the things i've discovered in life is i learn best sometimes when i hear it Mm. do you have an example um handyman type stuff um i've the last years it's it's been a lot of building decks on the backs of people's houses and I remember it better when I hear it. So if I'm measuring over here and then I got to walk over to 42 and three eighths and then I'll say four and I make the cut at 42 and three eighths inches. And it's just, so for me, you have to listen to it. Yeah. You're given a problem and they just figuring out how you learn that that's a huge part of learning. And once you work your own individual brain, then the first part of learning has been accomplished, learning how you learn best. Yeah. Um, And I I would agree with that too. So that begs the question though, even though this is kind of meta in a sense, how can we as individuals learn how we learn? (laughs) Okay. That's a great question. And I think the way that and I can only speak for our society because this is the only society I've ever been a part of, but I think that the way we do it in our society really works pretty well. You can't, we have to go through these stages of elementary school, junior high, high school, and I know there's tons of baggage and tons of social development and things that come with it, but we have to go through these these stages of education in our society I feel like because, and and on to college after that, because of still sort of discovering how we learn best. You can't just throw, this is not the 1700s, not that anything was wrong with the 1700s, but we can't (laughs) just throw 14-year-olds into the workforce and then you're just, that's what you do. Through the process of education in our society, I feel like the main goal of a student should be to learn how they learn best. And really probably the only way to do that is to be given education from every angle. 
and as you go through elementary school, junior high, high school, college, you have different types of classes with different styles of teachers, with mm -hmm. different classroom setups, with different pedagogy, which would be Whoa. like, oh yeah, I just dropped that on you. <laughs> wait, wait, like uh, project-based learning or more of a lecture or more of read the information and regurgitate the information or analyze the passage or solve the problem. I mean, there's yes. all kinds of, of learning setups. And I think through experiencing all of those throughout your very formative years, let's say from the age of eight to 22, mm -hmm. that's, that's where the discovery happens. And I think some people never really discover it and then yeah. end up, in a more frustrating later phase of life where they don't love, they don't really love what they do. They don't really uh, succeed in their chosen field. You'll have adults all the time who do something, don't like it, want to change their mind, do something else. And I think this is the success of education in our society is when we have people who leave that education arena and have sort of figured out what what way they learn best they have sort of figured out what things they enjoy mm -hmm. they have sort of figured out um a field or a career that uses all of the positive brain functions that that person has to their fullest yeah um, one question that I want to throw at you to kind of challenge that. So take it as like a devil's advocate, if you will. All right, I'll um, take it. Because I agree with you personally, but um, amongst my peers, I feel like a, cr a, oops, uh, a common criticism with the way our society um, presents education to people is that it's very academically based academically focused as in like sure. your maths your sciences sure. and if you're not good at that it's almost like it focuses on a specific niche that some people are very proficient at and as you can see in many schools there's always like a juggernaut of the class like somebody mm -hmm. who just aces all this stuff mm -hmm. but then and also you almost start to compare yourself to others like with this idea of intelligence, like, oh, am I not smart because I don't do well on a test when mm -hmm. Billy over there does? Um, when also it's just confusing because you have to consider different learning styles, like you said, but also proficiencies. Like some people are the juggernauts of theater. Some people are the juggernauts of band. Some people dominate the woodworking class um, or engineering or history, like these history buffs. Um, so how would you, what would you say about that? Like this criticism? Of, sure. I, like, I hear you. And of... I am, I agree with you 100%. And I'll play devil's advocate to your devil's advocate. Ooh. What about the juggernaut of a teacher? What about the juggernaut of a financial planner? What about the juggernaut of someone who works in a factory, those juggernauts are always going to be out there. There's mm. always people. There's always someone who is better than you at whatever task you're facing. The only people mm -hmm. in the entire history of the world who can say that they are the number one juggernaut, and these are still up for argument. You could maybe say a guy like Tiger Woods or... I'm using sports figures, but LeBron yeah. James, maybe bringing it into technology and business, Elon Musk, um, Bill Gates, these, these, uh, or like Da Vinci or something. The da Vin yes, yes. Those guys, the Da Vinci was the juggernaut to every Renaissance thinker. Mm -hmm. Elon Musk is the juggernaut to every you know, uh, young millennial <laughs> technology startup guy. I mean, the, so I feel like there's always going to be juggernauts. And so, but back to kind of replying to 
your idea playing mm-hmm. devil's advocate i i i do agree with you that the things that we learn in school sometimes seem as if they are not necessarily the things that you are going to be doing in whatever said career or whatever said field you go into like not practical like that a lot of it does seem generally not practical yes how many people in their daily lives or ever after high school solve uh, an equation for x how many people balance a chemistry formula equation whatever you call those where you got to balance one side with the other how many people take wood shop in high school but then ever go on to whittle or plane a stool um i so these things we're learning in school there are some base level of academia that we need to know i i i do think there is a base Hmm. but a lot i feel like a lot of education and this brings on brings me to kind of like another point about what is learning yeah a lot of education is being exposed to all different kinds of things and i feel like we do a decent job in our society of exposing kids to just about every not every but many many different educational fronts and of course some of them spark a kid's interest and others douse the kid's spark for and would sure. you mind defining front i'll say front like um Math and science, I guess you kind of could put those together, but ma- just math as a as a whole general front, mm-hmm. science as a whole general front. But then that front of science could be broken down into biology or chemistry or physics or, you know, all, then physics can be broken down. Yeah, so yeah. I, I, I'm not sure what kinds of general fronts there are extra fronts that i think we could put into education in our society but i feel like as a whole kids are exposed to quite a few different things and quite a few different fronts if you will and you do by the end of hopefully by the end of 12th grade you do kind of know which ones you like which ones you are pretty good at which ones you are not as good at and I think that discovery is a huge part of that discovery going back to of how one learns best, that discovery yeah. of, of what sparks your intrinsic motivation, your, your intrinsic spirit to be motivated. Being exposed to all of those different fronts is also part yeah. of the experience. And hopefully the goal by the end of a 12th grade year, let's say, for a kid to discover something that sort of interests them. Plus it might not be that the best parts of school and the best parts of education and learning as you grow up in our society might not be the academia at all. It might be that you are good at communicating with people. It might Mm -hmm. be that you are pretty good at being organized. It might be that you are pretty good at kind of uh, being a leader. Maybe you're pretty good at showing up to class late. Showing up to class late. Yes, <laughs> you could be. You could be that guy. So I, there are, I, there are lots of different things that people need to that kids need to discover about themselves through these twelve years, or if you are lucky enough to get to go to college four more years through these sixteen or eighteen years of education. There are lots of things besides the academia, that are also fronts that Mm -hmm. kids are exposed to and sort of figuring out which of those tunnels, I just changed it from fronts to tunnels, which of those tunnels (laughs) you sort of, sort of interest you that you want to follow is part of the learning process, learning how you learn best and learning what motivates you inside. Um, yeah. So that's, that's sort of a, 
another byproduct of going through our education system. Yeah. Um, so from that, though, I wanted to ask you this question that I thought of the other night um, while preparing for this conversation. Okay. Do you think learning is an innate part of life, like something that just happens, it's inevitable, or do we need to pursue it? Because let me just elaborate on it real quick. Like, obviously, we when we take math classes, we know if we like it or if we don't. But when we think about the nuances of, like, how organized am I? How much am I willing to work on this? Like, all these other things. How good am I at communicating? Don't we have to pay attention to these things in order to learn that about ourselves? I think we do. And I'm going back to the first part of of what you just said, like when yeah. you take math class and you decide whether or not you like it. And, and I sort of got stuck by when you said decide whether or not you like it. And, and that's something I refer to too, is finding these fronts or these tunnels or whatever that kind of spark you or motivate you internally. What, what, when, when we say decide whether or not you like it, and now I'm asking you this and I have my own thoughts on it as well. Yeah. What, what does that mean? Decide whether or not we like it because what I think is oftentimes if it's something you're air quotes again not good at then oftentimes that's something you don't like and mm -hmm. I think not liking something is even though correlation does not mean causation yes. I think not liking something is very strongly correlated to not being good at it and I feel like there is a separation between those two things oftentimes that we don't see mm -hmm. just because you are not good at something right away or really ever does not mean that you automatically don't like it. In fact, I think that we get those two mixed up and hopefully in life, everyone finds something that they maybe didn't like or that they maybe don't like that still then sparks that motivation to keep at it and to keep pursuing it to potentially find some success i will use my own personal experience i am sure i am a golfer i have been a high school golf coach for 20 plus years but I also play golf myself. And if I am extremely honest with myself, I don't like the feeling of the when I play in a competition for myself, like when I'm playing in the city tournament or if, when I played in a college tournament, I deep down couldn't wait for it to be over because of the general stress or pressure, et cetera, that I would put on myself. Like I, the competitiveness? I, yes. I, okay. I mean, I like the competitiveness. I do like the competition. But I think the reason that I like the competition is because I, because it doesn't feel good. And I don't really like it, if that makes any sense. I, it, Would you it mind? Drives me, it strives me to keep trying and to keep pursuing that thing that I'm not really good at. And when I say I'm not really good at it, I mean I'm a, a decent golfer, but I haven't, yeah. I don't have often success in those pressure packed golf situations. Be, and it is difficult and I don't like it. Yet at the same time, it is that not likable feeling that drives me to want to keep going to want to overcome it, to it's want like to maybe you'll do better next time or something. Yes. Or maybe I'm still currently in that particular round of golf and I want to keep going and I want it, it's, it's driving me to keep, keep my nose to the grindstone, to, to the grindstone, to keep, um, trying for lack of a better word. And that in the distance success that is so hard to attain that is really the driving force to get yourself through the thing that you don't like, to try to solve that statistics problem that you don't like, to try to dominate the biology exam that 
then this topic has kept giving you problems and kept giving you problems. It's the easy way out is yeah. to just say, I don't like this. I'm not doing it. Or let me just copy. I'm taking this back to education. Let me just copy <laughs> some kids work. Let me just call my friend and get the answer because I don't like this. But right. really maybe the things you don't like sh should or could end up being something that kind of motivates you to try to keep working harder and be successful. Um, yeah. And I've told you before that. Um, so Mr. T is my statistics teacher. And I took this class initially because it was like, yep, I'm bad at this, but I probably should take this. Um, but, and I but, just remember uh, yeah. the first, uh, what were you saying? I was just going to say just autumn, right there, just saying I'm bad at this, yeah. but maybe Casey deep down says I'm bad at this, but I want to get, I want to get in there. I want to try to figure this out. I want to try to conquer this little thing that I'm not good at. And maybe the reason I don't like it, maybe the reason you, you feel like you didn't or weren't good at statistics or that you didn't like statistics is because you hadn't really had some success in other, you know, similar fields oh, yeah. or whatever. So I cut you off. Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, that's, that goes along with it too. Um, I want to pursue psychology. So I knew that statistics would be important. For sure. Um, and also just in everyday life, it's like you should kind of understand this stuff. And I remember the first few units, it's like, God, this is like, what am I doing here? Like, I could not mm -hmm. understand the freaking like Z score <laughs> equation. Oh, uh, here we go. Curve. Oh, yeah. I was like, <laughs> what, what is this? But I knew that if I did what you said, like, you know, just call up somebody, just what's the answer? It's like, you know, I'm, it's just gonna like bite me in the butt later. Like it yeah. really is because yeah. especially since that is so foundational yeah. to the entire subject and everything. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I kept trying, I communicated with you, which is, you know, something not that easy to do. And also sure. not to mention that I've been online this whole year. So I've only met you officially, like I seen know. your face twice. I know. It's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that I found like a really interesting passion from it. Like I always thought I was like a right brain dude, like creative, yeah. all that. But yeah. from statistics, I actually learned... It's crazy how much I learned about myself, actually, because I don't think I'm necessarily left brain. Like, I still like thinking of creative things and whatnot. Sure. But I, I like analytical things. I like, I like counting. I like lists. Like, I always, if I have, like, a list of names, I always like doing that, you know? Like, mm -hmm. especially these videos. It's like, ooh, look at this list of topics and names. Yeah. And it's, it's satisfactory, I guess. Um, I hear you. And when I do like statistics problems, there's just something about like writing all these symbols that like, oh, this Greek symbol equals this and yeah. this other symbol equals this. And these 5,000 different P's that all represent different things. Literally represent <laughs> a diff. Every P represents a different thing. Yes. Yeah. And it's like, not only does it look cool and look smart, like one of those things that you see in a joke where it's like somebody's really smart and they're doing all these math equations, but you don't know what it means. And most yeah. of the time it doesn't mean anything. But it's yes. like, I actually do know what this says. And I can yeah. explain to you what this means and what I'm doing here. Yeah, absolutely. I know exactly what you mean. And I always try uh, talking about like uh, in a movie or something when they or in a commercial when you see the really smart professor or whatever writing stuff on the board, or I'm trying yeah. to think of uh, Goodwill Hunting. He would, he came in yeah. and wrote all that stuff on the board. I watched a movie uh, a few weeks ago called The Accountant, and he like was like a savant and could find things in the numbers. And really, probably all that stuff that they're writing on the board is just for visual effect for the movie. But then I find yeah. myself pausing it and trying to look through the numbers and see what they're <laughs> writing on the board and see if it's really just some director that told them to put that on there or maybe they hired a mathematician to show them what to write on the board so it would make sense to the 
one tenth of one percent of the population of the world who could follow whatever it's saying. So what's um, the answer? Is it is it legit? Uh, I feel like that there are legit symbols in there, but I feel like majority of the time it is not legit. Yeah, I mean, you just see a square root, and automatically it's complicated. Yes, and then they got there's always other Greek letters in there that even as with a degree in mathematics, I have, don't really have recollection of ever learning. So I'm yeah. sure there's lots of math that I haven't learned or I don't have a doctorate or anything, but I feel yeah. like I've been exposed to most of the symbols. And I feel like there's always a symbol, symbol or two in those commercials or movies that don't mean a thing. But back to kind of what you're saying is, it, it, that's my point exactly, that you maybe thought you weren't good at it that you didn't you weren't really looking forward to taking st a statistics course but you knew you had to because you want to pursue something in psychology and for sure there are so much statistics intertwined with psychology that that is something that you will have to master and use all the time um you've sort of discovered that maybe you do like it and maybe it is worth pursuing and it is difficult. And just because it's difficult, your initial gut reaction maybe was, I don't like this, but once you get into it, the, the difficulty really ends up being sort of a challenge and, right. and kind of like I was referring to with golf, it, it is maybe that challenge that is motivating to you. And maybe that's even the, the tunnel that you want to explore. Maybe that's the, the front that you have discovered is that when you are challenged with a problem, when you're challenged with something, that you are motivated by the solving of the problem mm -hmm. and, and the successful feeling inside of having conquered said task. Mm-hmm. And uh, let me ask you this real quick. How do interests play a role in what we learn and how we learn? Well, I think that they are kind of, uh, they're, they're sort of one and the same. I think that oftentimes something you are interested in is a motivating factor for wanting to learn. And if you mm -hmm. want to learn, if your desire to learn about a certain topic or about a certain subject or uh, to study a certain field, if your desire is higher, then your, your, your concentration is better, your motivation to do the work necessary to achieve those learning goals is greater. Um, I, I think those things are tied together for sure. And mm -hmm. it's, it's so it sort of seems contradictory to what I was just saying about maybe sometimes the things you're not interested in because you don't like them because you're not good that, at them could end up being something that is motivating. I think that the easiest way to be motivated about, about learning is to follow those things that do interest you. Even if those interests change after mm -hmm. you get into the learning of said field, but if you follow those initial interests, you are interested in psychology, and if, when you pursue your psychology degree, what if you get halfway through and you, you're in there and you say, boy, maybe I don't really love psychology. Mm -hmm. But the motivation at the time to learn that stuff was because it was interesting to you. I feel like that those interests do help us learn. They do help spark um, or, or motivate to achieve success, I guess, for lack of a better term, in that field. So yes, they are being interested in something and learning something are for sure tied together without question. Yeah. And then I want to ask you, kind of going back to education, what is the distinction between learning and education? Like we cool. think they're one and the same, but what is the difference you would say? Ah, I, I feel like society sometimes treats them as one and the same, but I feel like they're really not one and the same. Mm -hmm. The education, if we're just referring to this conversation, I, I would say the education is 
the process that we go through and the process of going to school and the process of uh, of studying all of these subjects and doing your tests and and trying to pass the eighth grade reading test and trying to pass your 12th grade statistics test and doing well in the ACT that that's sort of the education that's the process but learning really boils down to just back to the beginning discovering things about yourself and I feel like this this last little statement or question that you you put in kind of brings us back to the fact that I do feel like our society does a pretty good job with education in the fact that by the end of it hopefully you've learned or discovered things about yourself how you learn best how you what motivates you what yeah fields you want to pursue so they they work in tandem but the education the education to me is the process that you go through and the learning is the discovery piece is it almost like uh it's like education is the plate of food that the chef hands you but learning is deciding what foods you like better or you want to eat Sure. First, or yeah. eat all of and leave some of the rest. Or... Yeah, I, I would say, yeah, absolutely. And I, I was thinking of education is sort of like the military boot camp. <laughs> and there, it, and once you once you go through that military boot camp, it's not the specific task of crawling through the mud. And I'm, I've never been to boot camp. I'm just referring to back to commercials, kind of what I would see like. You know, what you see in movies or on commercials, it's not the it's task. just full metal jacket. Yeah, yes. <laughs> it's, not the being, it's, it's not the being <laughs> yelled at. It's not the specific thing. It is what it turns you into in the end. It's the discoveries that you make about yourself through that education process. It's the discoveries that you make about yourself. And how it, it, it's how it molds you into the person that you are. That is yeah. the learning. The education is the boot camp. And how you turn out at the end, that's sort of the learning part of it. Yeah. And it's all like decided upon you, right? And it is. It is. And everybody turns out different. And some people don't make it through boot camp. Some people uh, can't take it in education. Some people don't make it through. Some people can't take it. But it it is... I have said this to many students in the past, and but I can't believe I'm about to put it on a recording. But the education is like a game. It's all a game. It really is. We're uh -oh. just playing a game. Yeah, it's a game. Casey, it's a game. Yeah, I know. It is just a game. We're I've just lost playing. many quarters, Mr. T. <laughs> We're <laughs> just playing a game. and But this is a game you have to play. To, to be... To be able to live the second and third quarter, the second, third, and fourth quarters of your life, you got to play the game during the first quarter of your life. Because, and I'm referring to quarters not as 25 cents like you were. Yeah. I'm referring to quarters as like percentages. Yeah, so I realized to, the. Uh, okay. But I, the, I figured it yeah. was okay to to say the word quarter because you had just said it, so it felt right. <laughs> um, to be able to play, you got to play the game in order to be able to have choices in the second, third, and fourth quarter of your life. So and what is the game? Like, the game is going through the boot camp, game? man. The game <laughs> is going through the, the game is going through the boot camp. The game is, is, Turning in your homework. The game is uh, taking the ACT. The but man, game what is, if I don't want to do that? I know, I know, and, and that's I. I'm with you. That I can see not one to do. You think? Yeah, I, I'm referring to my own kids, but sometimes like the work they have to do, it's like nine o'clock at night. We've been we've been at multiple practices. Then they we get home. We're they're already doing homework for a couple hours and then they got to like write down definitions. 
really? Is that really the best use of their time? But you just got to play the game. And uh, the game isn't perfect. Boot camp isn't perfect. Huh. But in the end, in the end, the, the result of the game, I'd like to think, is a positive result. In the end, you've discovered things about yourself. In the end, you've learned how you learn best. In the end, after you've played the game, even if every aspect of the game isn't totally worthwhile to you personally, mm-hmm. there could, it could be a deciding factor for someone else. And yeah. I'm not saying writing down definitions in the sixth grade no. and having them ready to turn in in the morning is could be a deciding factor. But if I want to spin it into a more philosophical idea, maybe my sixth grader should have done a better job of budgeting her time over the week. And that is a skill. That is something that is important in life. And maybe she should have done a better job of planning ahead. Maybe she should have done a better job of, of using her time wisely at school and getting it done at school instead of waiting until nine o'clock or 10 o'clock the night before it's due yeah. after we've had a busy day. So she feels the punishment or she feels the stress of having to stay up and get those done. And, you know, maybe that one assignment isn't a deciding factor, but that's just a, a little aspect of the game that hopefully she can figure out for the next time. She does not function best when she saves stuff for the last minute. And maybe that will be a little lesson that she has learned through playing the game of education that she can carry on into the next aspect of life. So yeah. I think the game, education itself is a game. And we're all playing this game as students and the end result of the game is kind of like the end result of boot camp and it's the experience is different for every person but hopefully at the end you have a solid productive thinking and motivated member of society yeah and when i say society i mean the, the general human society as well as the you know, our own U S society, but hopefully there is a positive member of society that has been, that is a product of having played the game for 12 or 16 or 18 years or however long you're in the game. Yeah. And mind if I say this, cause I thought of a neat kind of metaphor for the game. I think a lot of people, a lot of people are aware that education basically is a game. But I think there's, we have to define what kind of game it is. I think a lot of people, especially in my age group and everything, they view the game as like a slot machine, like that kind of game. Like mm-hmm. you, you turn the lever and it's all up to luck. It's like, am I going to get a good teacher? Am I going to do well in the class? Um, uh, like all these things. And it's basically completely out of their control. You know, they want to spin it anyway because who knows if we'll get a jackpot. But it's all luck. And they feel disheartened because they feel like there's nothing they can do. Even though, and with a slot machine mentality, there really is nothing you can do. But that's not exactly the game that we're playing here. I think a better metaphor and one that just came in my head, although there's many other takes you could go with this. But think of like Tetris. Like Mm -hmm. a game where... It's like all these, it's like just a game. There's all these falling blocks and you got to put them in a line. And once they're in a line, it removes. And then you just have to keep doing that. If all the blocks fill up to the top, you lose. Um, But there's so many different strategies. And when you start playing it, it's like, oh, I don't know how to play Tetris. It's my first time. Like, I'm going to be really bad at this. But a game like that and any other game, The more you play it, the more you think about it, the better you become. But you have to pay attention to certain things. It's like, oh, well, if I array these different blocks, even though I don't know which blocks are coming next, there is a random component. But if if I put these blocks in this shape, then when I get that long skinny piece, I can throw that down the middle and then clear out all of these rows. And isn't that, doesn't that feel so good to throw that long block? (laughs) Yeah. Right down, right. I like to put the long block and leave it open on the end. And mm-hmm. then you just dial that thing over to the right side and just push it, 
push it straight down on the right side and boom, you've just knocked out five rows. I love it. But Right, but it's uh, like, think about back to the school idea with this Tetris thing. It's like setting up the blocks on the side to get ready for that skinny piece. It's like you did all yeah. your homework, you prepared for the yeah. test, you really yeah. sat down and learned everything. And then Absolutely. the skinny part is this test. And you could mess up, like you could put the skinny piece somewhere else and then it's like, okay, I got to rework this thing. Because there are consequences like in Tetris. If you put the block in a wrong spot, like that's bad, but it's not yeah. like the game's over. But if you don't act fast, you're gonna, you could topple over. So you have to adjust to it. Like if you miss the skinny piece, there's something else you can do. Some people feel disheartened, but again, you just have to reroute. But if you do well on that test with the setup, you can get that skinny piece, you can ace the test, and then look, look at you. You didn't procrastinate. You did your work and look, you learned it. You learned mm -hmm. something or two. Wow. Yes, you man. did. And, and really, I, I, I mean, Tetris, I was going to say it's that you talked about slot machine and then you said what kind of game you were thinking Tetris. Tetris is better than my example. I was thinking it was sort of like a maze or like a corn maze. And oh, you yeah. just kind of have to keep moving forward. But Tetris is a better, that's a much better example because there's more things you do than just walking. You can spin those blocks around. Yeah, and a you lot more You can move them left and right. You have a lot more control. And a maze, you're just kind of wandering, I guess. But so Tetris is a way better example. But really, it's it, the game itself and the, and the long skinny piece that goes down the right side that clears out your five rows. That is like taking a test, but then the five rows disappear and here we go. We're on to the next task. So really the success is not, yes, it is, it feels good and it's successful to ace that test and you yeah. feel like you've learned something, but the overall picture of education as Tetris is the fact that you have, you are playing Tetris, that it's the playing of the Tetris that is the game. It is Sounds not like the awesome. individual, yes, all those little individual successes, or even when you take the block that looks like an L and you flip it up on its end and you just clear out a couple rows, you have those little successes all along the way and those feel mm -hmm. good and they're motivating and, and hopefully they spark you to keep wanting to play Tetris. But it's not those successes that happen during the game of Tetris that is the point of the game of Tetris. The, well, I mean, they are for Tetris, well, but yeah. <laughs> for education, but for education, it's all of those little successes that you find that are, that end up being you learning about yourself and learning. And I don't want to say you're learning to play Tetris because then I'm saying you're learning to play the game of education. And yes, it yeah. is a game, but the result of all of those Tetris pieces and all of those little one row successes, two row successes, three row successes, and doing well on a test might be a two row disappearance in Tetris and doing well in a clash, you might get two long skinny pieces in a row and boom, you've knocked out five and boom, you've knocked out five again and yeah. you achieve some bigger successes, but then it just keeps coming at you. Just like life is just going to keep coming at you. And yeah, being able to take that education experience and become, and I wish I could think of something better. You don't become a Tetris player because, but maybe you do. Maybe education is what sets you up for learning how to play Tetris so that when you go into life and you're not being thrown American history, you're not being, the American history isn't being thrown at you or chemistry isn't being thrown at you, but there's other problems dealing with other things, dealing with stuff at work, dealing with stuff at home, dealing with societal issues. All of those things are being thrown at you. Those other fronts are being thrown at you and it's just in a different context. So maybe in a sense, you may have just opened up my eyes that this ed this game that we play, that's education. And I do, again, think that education is sort of a game that we're playing, but it's really preparing you for all of these other, it's all of these things that come after yeah. the game of education is over because maybe the game doesn't end. It's just It just looks different. The game mm -hmm. isn't the game isn't American history and statistics and algebra anymore. The game is dealing with global pandemics and how that affects you on the inside. Or like dealing dealing with relationships with people, absolutely. Dealing with financial stress, dealing with um, changes in the economy, dealing with uh, losing a job, having to find another job, dealing with challenges around your property and 
you know, a leaky basement or yeah. just all the kinds of things that are thrown out. These are all just, <laughs> just the continuations of the game. They're just in different forms. So the you know, result wanna... of education, the result of, oh, I'm not done yet, Case. I'm not done. The result oh. of education is not, the successes in education is not the individual lines that you clear out. It's becoming a good Tetris player. That's mm. the success in education. Yeah. And what I was going to say too, which I thought was like, was one of those, like you get goosebumps because it was, it's a good point. Oh yeah. Think and I probably all... just cut it off, didn't I? <laughs> no, I still, I still have it. I still have it. Don't okay, worry. good. Think about what kind of game Tetris is too. It's a single player game. Yeah. This, everybody thinks school is like, oh, it's like, you know, I'm competing against all these other people. Look at this juggernaut who got 100% and I'm stuck here uh, with a 71. Okay, so I just got the chills too. Yes, bringing it back. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's like, uh, well, you're playing Tetris. It's a single player game. This is your game. You're not actually competing with other people. No, and, you are not. Yeah, and as you're going to learn, when you, like everybody's kind of, you know, in the education process, we're all kind of put into this uh, almost like serialized, samey environment. So mm -hmm. our lives are pretty similar, but as we expand and go different routes, we obviously become more nuanced, go through more niche pathways. The game is just completely individual and different. You can't compare. So you're not playing a multiplayer game. You're playing a single player game. And you, you always are. were. And that's kind of the secret. Yeah, absolutely. You absolutely are playing a single player game. And you are. I love the fact that you just brought it back to you're not competing against Bobby the Juggernaut at <laughs> whatever subject. You're just trying to keep playing yourself. And if, you're, if your whole screen fills up with blocks and it bricks all the way over, then you just start another game and you just keep going and you keep trying and some people are inherently better at tetris they're better at at thinking algebraically from an early age but it doesn't mean you can't get good at it it doesn't mean you can't keep playing doesn't mean and, you can't like it you no know, it doesn't mean you can't end up liking it absolutely and you got to keep playing cuz otherwise that dude's just going to keep bricking over and if you just give up and you start throwing those things, those shapes down one at a time and seeing how quickly you can. Because I know you've done that in Tetris too, where you try to line them all up once or twice and get them, see if I can get this thing to fill up in like five moves and mm -hmm. brick all the way over. Then, you know, it's like sitting down in the corn maze. You're just, you're not moving on anymore. You, you gotta, you gotta keep grinding and keep playing the game. And, Right. For and it's those... not like in the corn maze, you have a scythe and you can just say, screw this. I'm just going to go like slice yeah. this. Yes. Like, you know. <laughs> Tetris, Tetris is a way better, a way better simile. <laughs> and in education, what I would hope is that when kids get to that point where they're like, screw this, I'm not doing this anymore. I hate this. Uh, I can't, I, I'm not going to function. Well, then hopefully, hopefully the school system or the school or whatever school system they're in is set up such that there is some support because obviously nobody is automatically perfect at everything and everybody is going to struggle in various subject areas or various time management aspects or social aspects and hopefully yeah. be, as as an adolescent those support systems are there at home or some at school where there's someone there to help you you know, figure out this little Tetris move to kind of get your way past when you get the squiggly piece. And maybe yeah. if you turn them 90 degrees counterclockwise, you can fit them down there a little bit easier. Uh, try this strategy. Why don't you turn him three times clockwise and then he fits down the other way. Oh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe so, yeah, hopefully those support thing. structures are in place. Yeah. That's a thing we should add too. It's like, it is a single player game as at the end of the day, you're playing Tetris, but that doesn't mean that you're alone. It mm -hmm. means you're not competing with others, but you still, you're not alone. You have people. Oh, if you everybody's get, playing Tetris. We're yeah. all doing it. And there's people coaching Tetris too. <laughs> there's people, yeah. there's people that dedicate their life that are, have chosen a career path where 
you can kind of try to give those little Tetris tips. But really, the the overarching uh, idea, I think, of of a teacher or school person personnel should be to help you learn to like Tetris for whatever reason works best for you. And Mm -hmm. even though some teachers or educators might be better at uh, explaining the strategy of rotation of the Tetris pieces and someone else <laughs> might be better at explaining the strategy of moving the pieces left and right. Some people might be better at the strategy of really pointing out how good that Tetris music is. Oh, and yeah, some people good. might be pointing out, oh, you got the strategy. Don't, don't forget about this block over here. It tells you the next shape that shows up on the left side of your screen. Mm-hmm. Uh there's different teachers and different educators with different expertise in different areas, but really the goal of those educators should be, and I, I think for the most part, and being sort of Pollyanna about it, that m- most teachers, especially in the ones that I have come into contact with throughout my life, are there for the right reasons to overall help kids learn to sort of like this game to learn to sort of like playing Tetris and they can advise on their own strategy expertise, but really it's about learning to love the game and learning to love playing Tetris and competing, but not against others competing. You know, against it's yourself. so funny about that. Uh, like we're, uh, I'm looking at the clock here and we're, we're almost like at an hour. So I think we can start heading it up. Uh, okay. Closing, but that leads me to the question, my final question to bring us home. And you just kind of set it up perfectly, so I just want to give you props for that. All like, right, that's all right. perfect pitch for the Grand Slam. Okay. Um, so why should we try to love to learn? Why should we try to love to learn? Why should we love to learn, essentially? That, that's the way I wrote it. It's a little clunky, but, you know. Okay. Why should we love to learn? Well... I think that learning is, and you, this takes you, takes back to sort of a question that you asked uh, uh, a long time ago. You said, is learning inherent or is it something that we sort of learn? And I don't know if you phrased it that way, but yeah, like, really when you, when you, it, it has to be, and I've never really thought of whether it's. In, if it's in our genes to want to learn. But if you look at history, and if you look at, and I'm not a history teacher, but if you look at just how far mankind has come in just the recorded history that we know about, learning has to be inherent. It has to be. Because mm. how, in, how else could you explain technological development How else could you explain societal development? How else could we explain how far humankind has come from the beginning of recorded history to now? I mean, that is... How the ancient Mayans or whoever, any ancient tribe, how they discovered irrigation, which was this uh, immensely smart tactic to farming... It's like nobody taught you that. No, nobody no, no. taught you how to farm. Who, who even gave you the idea that you could farm and not just forage? What? I, and I, I mean, if you, we could explain it with aliens. Maybe the aliens came down and did. I'm, I'm just kidding. I mean, but they are it's, confirmed. It's, now. The, yes, I have heard that they are confirmed. I have heard that they are confirmed. But <laughs> it is. It, uh, that is a whole nother podcast. It <laughs> the, the the love of learning and the desire has to be built somewhere in our genes. It has to be. Mm -hmm. And we aren't all the ones who came up with ancient Mayan irrigation. We aren't all the ancient Egyptian pyramid designers. But inside all of us has to be. It has to be an ingrained desire to learn because just based purely on the facts of how humankind has developed over centuries and centuries. There is no way that that stuff happens without it being ingrained, embedded 
in our in the genes of humankind. There's no way. It doesn't just happen because, oh, I think that I would like to build this pyramid to the sky. I think that I would, I, I think, well, I kind of want to learn want to learn how to build a skyscraper. Yeah, you don't just, I mean, it, it is a motivating, intrinsically motivating factor. There's something inside us that causes us to want to learn. So I am convinced that it is inherent and embedded in our DNA, a desire to learn. And I don't know if we'll ever be able to scientifically put our finger on which gene, which strand or whatever does that, but it is inherent in humankind for sure. And you think that's the same for people who just like don't really, like they hate school or something? Well, I think that you have to allow that that inherent genetic desire to flourish you can absolutely squelch it you absolutely can but inherently we are beings that want to learn and i think that there's a lot of different facets to that it's finding things you like it's seeing a little bit of success it's overcoming a challenge it's solving a problem it's getting the tetris piece down the right side and knocking out five yeah. lines which will jump you onto the next but there are ways to squelch there are definitely people who squelch that desire but inside i think inside all of us deep down is an inherent uh, desire to learn and to want to learn we just have to find it we have to put ourselves in the right position for success to continue to keep that motivation for learning going and hopefully the education system sets people up to want to learn and to want to use that inherent um trait of humankind yeah and i guess even though i said that was the last question um how do you yourself as a teacher kind of uh uh how is your teaching inspired by kind of these ideals like what do you do for your students well um i mean what do i do for my students to help with these things or what do i do for myself as a learner uh, I mean, kind of both, but just like, how do you try to present these ideas to people? I think I've, I'm lucky enough that I can, the first thing that pops in my head is I feel like I have a subject matter that I teach that in, in being statistics that I've been lucky enough to get to teach over the last however many years, that it is a subject matter that has so much application and so many, um, so many different facets that appear in other aspects of life. And it's also something that kids, by the time they get to this class, haven't really been exposed to. So I have the luxury mm -hmm. of teaching a subject matter that people don't come in, ex except for you, with preconceived notions of it being easy or hard or whatever. <laughs> They're just kind of eager and ready to go. So I, I would say for me, um, luckily, one of the one of the things that I use is the subject matter itself and having that be sort of eye opening to kids. Uh, I wish we had, I wish I had a chance to teach like a next level of statistics where all of the stuff we learn in the first statistics class, we would get to apply and actually do. And maybe at some point, and I'll bring this back to how do I keep myself motivated as a learner? Maybe once I get to a certain point in life where I would have the time to produce, pr pursue something like that, then that would keep me motivated and keep me going to want to learn myself how to be a better teacher of a next level of statistics. And so I would say for me, luckily, it's the subject matter that I can rely on to do a lot of that motivation. But it, it's the, really the presentation of the subject matter and, and having students have positive attitudes towards the subject matter mm -hmm. um, that are two that those are the two main my two main tools and it's a little easier to do with statistics it's a little harder to do with something like algebra 2 which is a little mm, oh, I won't say it too loud it's a little drier <laughs> yeah but so you got to work harder on the on the personal motivation part for the students and the subject matter like that um 
yeah. than I feel like I do in statistics. But I, I think the overall goal for me on a daily basis is I would like a student to walk out of the room saying, oh, that was kind of a good class. Oh, I enjoyed that. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that's – lots of times that's sub- – yeah, and what I'd tell you, just from my experience, I think you've done a really good job. Um, and one thing that I notice noticed throughout this whole year, like one big strength that you do that I think helps you, help you teach, help students stay engaged, is this idea of being personable. Like you're not like... Sure. You're... You, you hear this all the time with people criticizing politicians, for an example, of like, these people don't really seem like people. They're just mm-hmm. like, they're doing these things in this faraway place that I don't sure, even know. Sure. But so like students could see a teacher and be like, oh, he's a teacher. He has a job to do and that's it. Yeah. But I mean, you tell us like your random stories of the day, um, sometimes a song, sometimes like naming your dog <laughs> yeah. like these yeah. random things that have nothing yeah. to do with anything but this open discussion allows us to know who you are mm-hmm. as well as like your personality and your style and made better like it's not just that you have this like separate uh, aspect to your class but it's almost infused at the same time like your personality isn't oh i'm fun when i'm talking about random story and now I'm like strict and serious and Mr. Mean guy over here yeah. when I'm getting into the nitty gritty. But it's like infused in both. So, you know, like when something cool happens, like we figure out or we successfully complete like a test. I guess mm-hmm. that's a procedure or something. You know, we have the whole class clap and everything. Like it's so ridiculous. It's like... It, it- yeah, I, it is. It is. But, but it's at the great. End, you know? Yeah. And then at the end, hopefully a kid will walk out and say, that was kind of fun. Yeah. That was kind of fun. And maybe I can't I put have. my finger on exactly why that was fun, but it was kind of fun. And then you start to have a positive view of of the subject matter, regardless of whether it's easier for, I feel like it's easier on something like statistics. But you have that positive view of it because I have a positive view of it because that positivity is kind of contagious. And, and I would... Well, I appreciate those things that you said because I feel like those are kind of those should be goals for for everybody and whatever you're doing, whatever job you have or whatever interactions you have, if you kind of stay positive about them and it's right and have some of your personality come through, then then people are going to appreciate it more. So I all right, I I like how you put that in words. That's good. Yeah, and to bring it back to the topic, I've learned from you that that trait of personability like that's a good trait for people to listen to you and everything like just kind of being relatable in a sense like you're not just so different than everybody and i bet you've learned from all of your students like oh absolutely this is what i do when i have a loud student who blurts out every time during class this is what i do when somebody's too quiet and never asks for help but isn't doing too hot like this is what i can do for that Here's how I can constantly regulate my classes to make things yeah. better or more efficient. Like maybe there's a, a way of explaining that's much more complicated than like a simple response. So it's just all this constant regulation, you know? Yep, I hear you. And in a sense, that's kind of what learning is, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I feel like you have, Jesus kind of put it in a nutshell right there. Yeah. Like but a nice pistachio oh, shell. Yeah, it was. It was a hard, sh- a hard shell to crack. A hard shell to crack. Yeah. But anyway, I guess that's all we got here. So thanks so much for joining me, Mr. T. It is my pleasure. I enjoyed it. I can't believe how time flies. <laughs> right. Um, well, it's been a good time for sure. And with that said, thanks everybody for listening. I'll see you guys next time. All right. See you guys.